Hello, my name is Thomas Groom, and I want to reflect with you on the future of ministry in the Catholic Church and what our best hopes might be. And I'm going to propose that we're already in the midst of a great rolling sea change, a paradigm shift, if you will, and that the future of Catholic ministry is not going to look the same, or they're not at least the very same, as the past. In many ways, the future has already begun. The Second Vatican Council catalyzed what Thomas O'Mara has called an explosion of ministry in the Catholic Church. And any list of statistics bring home this point. Uh, in the USA alone, uh, there are now th some 35,000 lay people in lay ecclesial ministry. Just a tremendous, phenomenal number and uh, that has grown very, very rapidly in lay ecclesial ministries. We now have about 15,000 uh, permanent deacons, married deacons in this country. So when people say, uh, can ordained ministry be open to married people, to married men? The answer is, well, we already have about 15,000 of them in this country. And any other statistic, Catholic schools, for example, 1965, about 90% of their faculty in administration were vowed religious or priests, and 10% laity. Now the figures are directly reversed, about 90% lay people, about 10% uh, vowed religious or priests. Um, in many ways, the, the, the Vatican II catalyzed this explosion of ministry because of its reclaiming of baptism, uh, not because of what is said about ministry per se. In fact, when you go to the abbot edition of the documents of Vatican II, if you look in the index for a ministry, there is no entry. And when you look up ministers, it simply says, see clergy. So it wasn't that Vatican II rethought ministry per se as much as it radically rethought baptism and in a sense came up with a theology of baptism that would be new if it wasn't in fact so old. It's the theology of baptism from the first uh, Christian communities. And so you hear Vatican II in Lumen Gentium, for example, chapter uh, paragraph 10 saying, the baptized by regeneration and anointing of the Holy Spirit are consecrated into a spiritual house and a holy priesthood. A fairly amazing language to be used of the baptized. Uh, that the baptized share in the priestly, prophetic, and kingly functions of Christ. And uh, Lumen Gentium 31 adds, in the mission of the whole church to the world that lay people by baptism share in all of the integral ministries and missions of the church. In fact, Lumen Gentium 32 says that they all share a common dignity from rebirth in Christ, a true equality. In other words, in this body of Christ, no one is any more baptized than anybody else, and all are fully responsible for the, for the priestly, the prophetic, and the kingly functions and ministries of Jesus of Nazareth. And so, for example, baptism calls us, and this is the priestly function, to full conscious and active participation in the, in the, in the worship life of our church, uh, Constitution and the Liturgy, paragraph 14. It call, our baptism calls us to, ta to take sides uh, with those who are poor or in any way afflicted. In other words, the prophetic function of our faith, uh, Gaudium et Spes, paragraph 1. And then the co-responsible function that we have by participating in the, in the ministries of Jesus. Roman Gentium again says in uh, paragraph 37 that we are entitled to express our opinion on things which concern the good of the whole church. In, all, in other words, all of the baptized are held responsible for the purpose of the church in the world, to carry on God's saving mission in Jesus Christ. What begins in baptism is affirmed in confirmation, is constantly sustained by our participation in Eucharist. All initiates us into the body of Christ and designates each one of us uh, for ministry within the church and then through the church to the world. Vatican II did not reverse. In fact, it continued in the clergy-laity divide of the church. Yet, by its reclaiming of baptism, with such expansive rhetoric as we've just listened to, it made inevitable, in a sense, what I call a breaking open of ministry. And I was once in a public forum, and somebody put up their hand and said, but Professor, isn't priesthood breaking down? And I thought for a moment, and then what was an epiphany for me, I said, no, hopefully clericalism is breaking down, but priesthood is breaking open.
and it's breaking open out into the whole Catholic feature, people of God. So in a sense, our future has already begun. What are our best hopes? Where do we go to draw fresh hope? How do we keep good hopes alive? I'm going to propose something fairly self, it's so self-evident that it could be alarming. It may sound uh, indeed like stating the obvious, but I'm convinced that the future of ministry lies in the roots of ministry, and especially in the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, and that the renewal and reforms and the new possibilities uh, for ministry, the hopes for ministry in the Catholic Church, in fact, um, will be best sustained and realized if we return to the modeling and the example of Jesus the Christ. That Christian ministry, however we craft it, should always be appropriate uh, and fitting for a community of disciples of Jesus of Nazareth, the one we know to be the Christ. Indeed, this ministry has to be enculturated in our time and place, and yet we will never do any be better than to minister as Jesus did. Keenan Osborne summarizes, he says, Jesus' own ministry remains the abiding source, the model, and the dynamism of all Christian ministry. End of quote, and I say, Amen. So then we ask the question, well, what was, how did Jesus understand his mission? Uh, what were the ministries he took on to serve that mission? And then what was his approach? How did he go about it? So first, his sense of mission. He expressed his purpose, his mission in life, primarily, at least throughout the Synoptic Gospels, through the symbol, the reign or the kingdom of God. From the first time he appears in public, according to Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus declared, this is the time of fulfillment, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the Gospel. God's saving activity, this is how he would have understood uh, the reign of God. God's saving activity from sin and for life, for a fullness of life for all, as he will say in John 10.10. 10. For the shalom that Jesus had learned from his Hebrew roots. God's desire of wholeness and holiness and fullness of life for all of God's people and the integrity of God's creation. The reign of God is a tense of symbol. Uh, in Jesus' preaching with lots of both and meanings. In other words, for Jesus, the reign of God is already and it is not yet. It is for here, it is for hereafter. It is personal, it is communal, it is spiritual, it is social. It's to shape our politics, but it's to shape our prayers as well. It's a symbol of hope and a symbol of command, a symbol of promise, a symbol of responsibility, and so on. The, real, the reign of God in the preaching of Jesus makes very clear that it will be realized by God's grace. It comes as gift, as gratia, and yet as covenant partners uh, with God after the way of Jesus of Nazareth. We must live for what God wills, for what God desires for all of people and for all creation. In other words, Jesus' disciples indeed should pray, Thy kingdom come but we also must commit ourselves to doing God's will on earth as it is done in heaven. Gaudium et Spes summarizes the church has a single intention that God's kingdom may come and that the salvation of the whole human race may come to pass. In other words, and again quoting Lumen Gentium chapter 15, the church is the universal sacrament of salvation. It's to be a sacrament of God's reign in the midst of the world, a credible, effective sign, community of what Jesus intended and longed and hoped for through this symbol reign of God. So the mission of Jesus was the realization of God's reign. The church's mission, of course, must be likewise. What were the ministries that Jesus carried on in the name of the reign of God? Well, there are many ways to schematize that, of course, but I find a very compelling and suggestive text to be Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and the following. When he comes into the synagogue at Nazareth, his hometown, on a Sabbath day, and he searches for, the Greek verb there is heurisko, which means he looked for it. That's why he found it. There many translations says he found the text. Well, he did because he looked for it. He finds the text of Isaiah chapter 61 and declares that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. 
Liberty to captives, sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim God's year of favor. And then he closed the text and declared in full view and in public that this very day, the passage, the promise of Isaiah was fulfilled. Looking at that text and at the life of Jesus, I believe you can begin to think of a fourfold schema of ministries, and this will be picked up and even clarified further uh, in the new ta in the in the new in the first Christian communities. Uh, clearly, he intended, and therefore would intend his disciples and the community of disciples to preach, to teach the liberating word of God, the prophetic word of God. So preaching, teaching. The word will always be integral to Christian ministry. It will always be an essential core function of what we're supposed to do in the world. Clearly, he intended and intends us to care for, suma, for human suffering, physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever kind, to care for human suffering with love, with compassion, and with justice toward all. Thirdly, he called people into a community into a community of free and right relationship with God, with self, with others, and with creation. So koinonia and community building will always be an integral ministry for the Christian community. And of course, he intended us to worship as if everything belongs to God. I always think that's what the Jubilee year, uh, this year of God's favor is really about, to return to God everything because everything belongs to God. So it's the ultimate act of trust in God, of worship of God. We'll come back to those ministries and see how they were reflected in the first Christian communities in a moment. But for now, what was his style of ministry? He, his purpose was the reign of God. He had these fourfold, and there are other schemas of it, of ministries he carried on in the name of God's reign. How did he go about it? Clearly, and again, from the, from the gospel uh, witness and the witness of, to the faith of those first Christian communities, we have this clear sense that he had a deep commitment to building up an inclusive community of outreach. And of course, his table fellowship um, is the epitome of that, an inclusive community. Uh, that cares for its own people but has this extraordinary outreach to all, without borders, without limits, even including enemies, uh, to anyone in need. Secondly, he reached beyond service to empowerment. Um, it's amazing to hear him stand up on that hillside and say to, the, to everybody, and it's clear from Matthew chapter 7, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, that he was indeed addressing the crowds, uh, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Uh, I mean, imagine poor uh, peasant people hearing these extraordinary words from him. Uh, tremendous empowerment. And you even look at his miracles of healing. Um, they, they nearly always include a tremendous affirmation of the person who has received the healing. Uh, your faith has made you whole. Uh, your faith has cured you. Not I have worked a miracle and I have uh, saved your life or uh, cleared you from the, from the hemorrhage or whatever it might be, but your faith has done it. Uh, tremendous empowerment and affirmation of the people that he served. Um, a clear commitment, I believe, throughout his public uh, ministry to partnership. A partnership with the disciples and partnership of the disciples with each other. From the very beginning of his ministry, he begins to call them and, and says to those first, those first apostles, disciples to be called, come and we will fish for people together. Uh, we're going to do this together. Um, Luke chapter 10, he, he sends them out two by two. He chooses, chooses 70 others, but he sends them out in pairs, two by two in partnership, tremendous commitment to working together in partnership. And of course, all of this is picked up in Paul and the, in the body of Christ imagery and where all the bits and pieces are to work together and each one has its own gift to bring to the body and yet the, two, the hand can't do without the foot or the eye can't do without the ear and so on. It's all to work together in partnership. The fourth characteristic of his style of ministry that I lay out, that, I, that uh, at least from my perspective, that I, I recognize, he had this tremendous commitment to constantly invite people to integrate their lives and their faith and to put the two together as a lived faith. 
Um, you see it in his style of preaching and the whole pedagogy that he used. Begins with the ordinary and the everyday of people's lives. You know, uh, sores going out to sow seed, merchants searching for fine pearls, uh, women at the well, a woman searching for a coin she has lost. Um, you name it, the people going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and uh, just the ordinary and the everyday, a kid running away from home and looking for his share of the property and so on. He takes the ordinary and everyday of people's lives and it turns it around, turns it inside out, brings it to tremendous perception of faith and of what the faith might mean if they ever were to live it. My summary of it is he constantly invited people to bring their lives to their faith and their faith to their lives as an, as an integrated uh, life and faith together. Fair enough. How did ministry then fare in the first Christian communities? The Pentecost story begins this tale, of course, and it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, that, that, that there were about 120 persons present in that upper room, and it says some of the women of the disciples and Mary, the mother of Jesus, were there. So it's a large gathering of the men and women in that upper room. I think it's always important to make that point about Acts chapter 1 because Acts chapter 2, we've often imaged it, and the artists have done this too, as if it was simply the Holy Spirit descending upon the apostles, upon the twelve, because by now there was, they had replaced Judas, and indeed there are now twelve apostles again. And... Uh, you know, the, the, the photos uh, presented that way, but um, the text makes clear that they were all present. There's 120 of them present. It says there was a, a strong wind uh, came as tongue and with tongues of fire and rested on each one of them present. So not just on the apostles, uh, but rather, and it goes on, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. As a ministry then, they began to devote themselves, and this is Acts chapter 2, verse 42, to devote themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life. So there you have it, the ministry of the word, the communal ministry, the, 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 the uh, koinonia ministry, to the breaking of the bread and the prayers, in other words, the liturgia, the worship, for, uh, the worship ministry. And then it adds, and they would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to each one's need. In other words, the diaconia, the care for the others. And many of the terms, there are many terms that come out of those first Christian communities to describe um, the kinds of ministries that the first Christian communities perceive themselves as called to carry on in the name of the mission. Their mission was the coming of the reign of God and Jesus Christ. But then what was the work on the ground that they recognized they were supposed to do? I think you can again summarize those in that fourfold schema. Uh, and I keep them with W words. It goes back to my uh, days of teaching undergrads here at Boston College. Um, witness, word, worship, and welfare. Witness. There were to be a community, a koinonia, with credible witness, martyria. Uh, witness, a lived faith in God and Jesus Christ, a faithfully living the way that Jesus had taught and modeled, and of course living it for God's reign in the world. So a community of witness. We'll always be called to be living witnesses to our faith. Um, wasn't it St. Francis that was often recorded as saying we're to preach the gospel all the time. Sometimes we may need to use words, but the primary preaching and evangelizing is by the lived witness of our faith. Secondly, those first Christian communities recognized themselves called to a ministry of the word, uh, to preach, to teach, to evangelize, this kerygma, this didache uh, that comes to us through the New Testament, through the Hebrew scriptures, and then uh, as the years unfold, through Christian tradition as well. Thirdly, they saw themselves as called to assemble as a community for this public work, this liturgio of worshiping God together. So to worship God will always be an integral aspect of the ministries that our church is to carry on in the world. And then fourthly, to render service, diakonia, uh, service to human well-being, to human welfare, particularly service to those most in need, spiritually, physically, psychologically, promoting human welfare as God's own work of salvation. 
So witness, word, worship, and welfare, uh, or well-being, if you prefer, these will always be constitutive of the essential ministries of the church. It was very clear from those first Christian communities that all Christians are responsible to carry on this mission of Jesus, to participate in the ministries of the community, that all should work together, as I said earlier, like a body, like, like the body of Christ, enlivened by the Holy Spirit, and that no gift and no service should trump any of the others. In other words, there's not much sense at all in those first Christian communities of any kind of hierarchical ordering of ministry. In fact, and Favre points this out in his groundbreaking historical work, the first Christian community seemed to have no sense of division between clergy and laity. In fact, they don't even use the terms laity. That very word isn't used until centuries later into the, uh, into the first, uh, beyond the first Christian communities. Um, yet, on the other hand, they realized that all of the baptized were to carry on these ministries, these ministries of word, worship, witness, and welfare. And yet, the first Christian communities clearly recognized that some people had particular functions within those more generic ministries. There were particular jobs that needed to be done. And while all of the baptized indeed were to participate in them, yet certain people had particular charisms that the community needed to carry on particular functions. So what did the communities do? As far as we can tell, they designated people for those more formal functions of ministry. In other words, to act in its name with a particular function of service. Now, the scripture scholars and patristic scholars vary in their listing, but for example, Raymond Brown, Lord Reston, counts as many as 12 different designated functions of ministry within the first Christian, within the early Christian communities. Uh, so there was apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, pastor, miracle worker, healer, helper, administrator, deacon, elder, and overseer. And most scholars would say that they, they, these are different words, but perhaps the same functions in different communities, and they often overlapped. There is no blueprint at all that comes out of these first Christian communities for how we ought to organize ministry today. And there's certainly no pattern of hierarchical ordering within those ministries of the first Christian communities. Let me summarize five features of ministry in the first Christian communities beyond what I've said already. And here I'm just drawing together a lot of different uh, research from uh, a great diversity of, uh, of scholars and uh, scholarly resources. First of all, it's clear from what I've just said that ministry, the formal functions of ministry in the early Christian communities were very diverse. The functions were greatly diverse. Um, it, 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 as, far, so far as we can tell, they were organized more as a concentric circle, more like a pie than a pyramid, but great diversity in the functions of ministry. Secondly, great openness in the forms of ministry, and by that I mean the criteria by which somebody would get designated to f carry on one of these de formal uh, functions of ministry. Insofar as we can tell, uh, there are only three conditions, there are only three requirements for any of the formal ministries of the church. One, that a person be a baptized and a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Two, that she or he have the requisite charism for the particular function. In other words, if you're going to send somebody to preach, well, they, they need to have a bit of the gift of the gab, I suppose. If you want somebody to be the administrator in the community, well, they ought to have that gift. On the other hand, uh, if you want the, the good spiritual mentor and, and uh, discerner and counselor of souls, well, that's another kind of gift. And the one to serve the poor and organize the welfare work of the, of the community, that's another kind of gift. The key was that whatever the function of ministry the person was being called to, they needed to have the requisite charism. They needed to have the ability, the, the, the fire in the tummy, but also the disposition and the, the, uh, the gift it takes to do that kind of ministry. And then, of course, the third requirement was that you be designated. Uh, you be assigned to that ministry by a Christian community. Nobody could simply make themselves a minister that have to be called to it by a, by a Christian community. 
Um, how were they designated? We really have no sense of a clear-cut practice for designation to formal functions of ministry from those first Christian communities. The Pauline communities had a laying on of hands by local leaders, but that wasn't practiced in all the communities. And many communities, um, uh, there were many different, uh, a great variety of uh, different ministries were uh, designated by different ways. And in some communities, the laying on of hands were simply a symbol of blessing. Uh, didn't set a person aside for a particular uh, official form or function of ministry. Um, the next summary point I would make, I think that's, this is my third one if you're counting, is that the Holy Spirit, we're very confident that the Holy Spirit grants every Christian community what it needs to carry on its ministries. Whatever the charisms necessary, that the Holy Spirit will indeed place them within each and every community. Um, now, the community has to recognize the gift, but every community has what it needs to carry on the ministries of Jesus Christ in the world. Um, and Schilebeck makes this point that some communities, for example, could be left without Eucharist, would be simply inconceivable to those first Christian, Christian communities because the assumption was that the gift of holy order, of presiding, and leading the community at prayer and worship, indeed that gift was in the community, uh, but the community would need to recognize it and call it forward. Um, and lastly, I think this is number uh, five, um, I believe, and this is a fairly Catholic reading of the texts, I suppose, but so be it, um, that the twelve, uh, the twelve apostles had a central leadership role, and indeed uh, Peter, had a primacy among them, and I think the witness of the texts uh, bear that out. Beyond that, however, then you have to add that there is no further blueprint for how to organize the ministries of the church in any given age. There's a certain style, a spirit, certain guidelines, but nothing like a blueprint. Uh, there's great diversity, great variety, great openness, which in a sense could trouble us. But as Schilebeck again points out, that that openness of, in the first Christian communities, in a sense, should break open our imaginations as well. In other words, we're not nearly as hell-bound as uh, we might sometimes presume and some people might claim by way of the forms and functions of ministry for our time. What happened between then and now? Well, it's a long story and I'll only very briefly summarize. Uh, clearly, baptism receded as a fundamental foundational uh, sacrament for ministry. Uh, priesthood subsumes many of the ministries that were originally diverse. It takes on a very sacral and a very pedestalized uh, function. Some of that is for sociological reasons as much as for theological reasons. Um, Thomas O'Mara says that um, from about the 6th century on that min ministry in the Catholic tradition uh, diminished seriously and of course became exclusive and in, eventually in the 12th century became ex ordained ministry became exclusive to, to men and so on. Uh, you know the story as well as I. So uh, in a sense uh, it's the model and paradigm of ministry that certainly people of my vintage uh, grew up with. What are our best hopes from here? And now I want to look into the future but bring with us those resources from the first Christian communities and indeed from Jesus of Nazareth. I'm convinced and I'm just laying out my hope so I suppose I should say I'm, I hope I hope that the reclaiming of baptism will continue. In other words, that we continue to return to a radical theology of baptism. Radics in the sense of, in its etymological sense of root, that it become the root of our lives. Everything else grows out of there and returns into there. Um, radical in the sense that it shapes our whole being, our way of being, uh, as a noun and as a verb, who we are and how we live, that it's fundamental to our lives in the world, and will that that reclaiming of baptism, the original New Testament and early Christian community understanding of baptism, that it will encourage a tremendous sense of vocation among all Christians, 
um, that indeed we're all called together to be fully fledged members of this holy priesthood that First Peter wrote about, with everyone responsible, co-responsible, to consciously participate in the mission and the ministries of Jesus Christ to the world. All of us will collaborate to build up the church as a sacrament of God's reign and for the common good of society. Hopefully we will continue to evangelize through how we live our faith in the world, the ministry of the word, that we will always assemble for liturgy and live out in society the meaning of what it, our liturgy uh, refl symbolizes, what it means to truly belong to God and to recognize that all belongs to God. That we will continue to care for human welfare, for justice, for compassion, for peace and reconciliation in our church and in our society. So I think a tremendous return to a sense of great vocation that all of us have by our baptism. That would be one of my first hopes regarding the future of ministry. It has well begun. We've made good progress. We have miles to travel. Then, moving toward uh, more formal designated ministries, I think retrieving baptism, in a sense, will reposition holy orders more obviously within the faith community, rather than apart from, or over against, or up over, or on behalf of, that it will reposition ordained ministry within the faith community, and in a sense will help us to forge concentric circles of ordered ministry or priestly people, will you, if you like, with ordained ministry at the center of the faith community and yet uh, f f billowing out from there into many functions of designated ministries and then into volunteer ministries and out into society with God's liberating salvation. I understand designated ministry or ordered ministry, if you will, as any function of service and empowerment rendered by a baptized Christian who, gifted with the necessary charism by the Holy Spirit, is commissioned by, with, and on behalf of a Christian community to continue Jesus' mission of God's reign in the world. So, it's, it's, it's any function uh, that is rendered by a baptized Christian who has the gift to do so, who is assigned by a faith community, and does it on their behalf, continuing Jesus' mission of God's reign. I hope there will be great diversity in function, in other words, in what gets, de what gets defined or recognized as bona fide ministry. I, I would like to think we'll return to a great deal of the diversity of the early Christian communities. Um, and indeed, I will make a list, but it's a very partial list of such ministerial functions, uh, many of them of sub-functions within them, of course. But I think we will always be called to the designated ministry of evangelizing and preaching and teaching the kerygma of Christian faith. Uh, there will always be a ministry, I hope, of formation and education of the community and Christian identity, a ministry to preside and to assist at worship and celebration of the sacraments. As I'm saying, these are major functions here, but there are also uh, other minor, more minor functions within the liturgy, for example. Um, there, I hope we will, all, we will have an open uh, ministry that renders care care for the psychological and the spiritual well-being of people, uh, spiritual direction, pastoral care and counseling and so on. Uh, I think we'll, I, we will always need a ministry to attend to immediate human needs with compassion and empowerment. Uh, we'll always need ministries that engage in the works of peace, uh, peacemaking, social justice, uh, the works of justice in the world. Ministries that promote good stewardship of the community's material assets. A ministry, I think, of scholarship that lends ready access to the community's spiritual wisdom. And a ministry that encourages and coordinates the charisms of the community with holy order. So I'm hoping for a great diversity in the functions of ministry and what gets designated as ordered ministry, if you will. How about priesthood? My hopes for priesthood is that we will come to recognize the priest as having three essential functions, and this is not unlike what we presently do. I think priests will always have the role of presiding with the community when we assemble for worship and to celebrate the sacraments. 
Secondly, the priest will always have a core constitutive function in preaching the scriptures and the traditions of Christian faith. And again, especially when we assemble for liturgical worship. And thirdly, the priest will always have the, the, the function, the essential function, to coordinate and empower all the ministries in the community, enabling them to work well together. And isn't it interesting that the original etymological meaning of the word here, arche, means to work well together. It doesn't mean a hierarchy in the colloquial sense of levels of command coming down a pyramid, as it were. It's really about getting people to work well together. And I think the function of the priest will always be the ministry of holy order. Uh, yes, to preside uh, with us uh, in liturgical function, to preach and teach the word of God, and to coordinate the other ministries so that they work well together. How about the bishop? I think the bishop has similar functions. I hope will have similar, fun similar functions as the priest. However, with the oversight, the episcopate, for a diocese. The bishop is care called to care for the faith life of an integral Christian community and to promote its communion with the other dioceses and with the universal church. I'd love to think that we might return to the practice um, that the baptized and the presbyterate would have a significant voice in selecting their bishops, which of course is a very significant tradition in the church where the people of God and the presbyterate ha really genuinely were consulted in, um, in um, choosing their bishop. By way of the deacon, I think the diaconate could be a beachhead uh, for women entering into ordained ministry. Uh, there's ample evidence of women participating in the diaconal ministries of the early Christian communities. In fact, it looks as if our Greek, our Eastern Orthodox brothers are moving toward ordaining women to the diaconate. And uh, wouldn't that surprise us in a way, because we always think of them as a little more conservative than ourselves. Uh, but then that may be precisely why they would do it. They are more conservative and uh, would return to the practice of the early Christian communities of admitting women to the diaconate. Um, I think the diaconate, I hope that its function will be defined as one of service to human need more than token liturgical functions. Acts chapter 6 verses 1 to 7, which is always taken as one of the classic diaconal texts, uh, has them appointed to distribute food to the needy and hopefully uh, that's the kind of ministry that the diaconate will become uh, rather than some, as I said, token liturgical function, which I think it, that reflects more the reduction of ordained ministry to the sacramental functions. I hope there'll be great openness in form for the designated ministry. In other words, that the prerequisites or the requirements for any function of ordered ministry will be three and no more than three. That people have the preparation, the inclination and the designation, that they be prepared, prepared well to do it, uh, academically, intellectually, theologically, spiritually, that they have the formation for it, uh, that they, they, in other words, the preparation, that, that, that they have the inclination, in other words, the aptitudes, the abilities, the gifts needed to perform whatever the particular function might be. So if somebody, for example, has been designated to be a reconciler in the community, to, to, to facilitate the celebration of the sacrament of reconciliation, uh, that person needs particular gifts that uh, are fairly, they are present in the community, but you can't just presume anybody and everybody to have them. So that people have the preparation, but also themselves, the inclination, and, and the fire in the tummy, the passion, the charism uh, for this kind of ministry. And thirdly, that they simply have the designation. In other words, that a community of Christian faith in continuity with the apostolic line of tradition would call the these people by ordination or installation or designation or however to these functions, official functions of ministry. Preparation, inclination, designation, that's as much as I would hope will be required for the future of official functions of ministry in our church, including, including ordained ministries. I hope that the vowed life and the celibate life will always be greatly valued and promoted and encouraged and celebrated as an extraordinary sign of the reign of God already among us, but that no further requirements be 
um, insisted upon by way of designation for ministry. Um, that any function of ministry, ordained or ecclesial ministries, uh, can be fulfilled very well by people who have the requisite preparation, inclination and designation and that other conditions like maleness or celibacy, we would see those as unnecessary, at least to the function of the, of the ministry. Our style of carrying on ministry, I hope it will be a deeply communion, communal style, both for and through Christian community, upbuilding a Catholic community, uh, outreaching with a new evangelization, bringing Christians out into the world with this good news of God's liberating salvation, Evangelii Nunciandi. I hope that ministry will be a partnership, will be in collaboration with all of the functions, working well together and working with the people whom they serve. I mean, it's interesting to see the business world uh, talking about total quality management and uh, in encouraging and engaging the gifts of everybody in a particular uh, company or enterprise and because it's good business to get everybody involved and working together. So, so much of the uh, literature coming out of the business world is about partnership and collaboration. Well, surely Christians have, their, have even better rationale than, than good business, although it would be good business, uh, for working together. And you begin to rattle off the dogmas and doctrines and symbols that would encourage it. Our, our symbol, for example, of a triune God that our God, even within God's self, is in loving relationship and always toward us is in loving relationship. So surely our modus operandi should be one of, of good partnership, of loving partnership. Um, Paul's imaging of the, of the uh, body of Christ, the church is the body of Christ with all the bits and pieces working well together. Jesus warning his disciples in one way or another six different times throughout the four Gospels that they're not to lord it over others, that they're to be the servants of others, they're to work well together. So I also would love to think that we will move in Christian ministry beyond service to empowerment. Indeed, direct service will always be imperative, and yet ministry should empower people to help themselves, to help each other, elicit the gifts of all, affirm and nurture those gifts as needed, and enable people to put them to work. Lastly, I hope we will have a style of ministry, much as Jesus did, that will enable people to put their lives and their faith together as a lived faith. Vatican II said that the greatest heresy of our age was the failure of Christians to live their faith. That we proclaim it and profess it, but then it doesn't, the rubber doesn't hit the road, to use an inelegant phrase. So a ministry and ministries that enable people to take their lives and bring them to their faith and take their faith and bring it to their lives with a lived faith in the midst of the world, I think that would be a great way for us to go about doing our ministry. Whatever your hopes might be, I wish them well, I wish you well, abundant blessings on your good efforts, and whether you share my vision for the future of ministry or not, I hope we will continue to work together to be the kind of Christian community in the world that Jesus of Nazareth intended to be and to craft the kind of ministries and the functions and forms of ministry that will support that good mission. It will last until the end of time, so I think we still have, we still have work to do, but we still have time to do it. Blessings upon you and thank you.